Hi everyone and welcome to tonight's Goat Roadshow. Tonight we're talking all things meeting the market. We've got a wonderful lineup of speakers who are segmented all across the supply chain for you. Um, so it should be a really good webinar session. I might just quickly run through some um, housekeeping. So Bridget, if we can just go to the next slide, thank you. Um, I just ask that you can all please have your microphones on mute and your cameras are turned off. This session will be recorded and distributed by MLA. We'll also house this recording of this webinar on our MLA Goat Roadshow webinar archives on our YouTube channel. So if you are interested in anything else or would like to send the recording on to a friend, you can always review it, which is great. Um, we will hold all questions to speakers via the Q&A box down the bottom. So that's located on the bottom of your panel for your Zoom. And if you can put any questions and answers that you have in that chat, we'll answer them at the end of the webinar session when we'll do a panel of um, questions. If the webinar is discontinued, which we hope it won't be, but we will issue a new link within 10 minutes so we can get it back up and running. Just the next slide, please, Bridget. Wonderful. So my name's Dr. Melanie Smith. I'm the project manager for Sheep and Goat R&D. I'm part of the Goat MLA Goat program with um, Joe Gebbles, who's the program manager and is located over in Perth. Just next slide, Bridget. Thank you. So tonight we're gonna to be talking all about understanding your target market within the meat industry. And the first step to understanding what your target market is when we're looking at meat production is all about understanding the supply chain and what market you're trying to target. So just on to the next slide, please, Bridget. So this is a really, um, I guess, basic overview of the Australian goat meat supply chain. We've got our, our farmed goats, which are our more intensively managed animals that tend to be more of a boar Kalahari type um, system. We also have our managed rangeland goats and also our rangeland harvested goats. So those three main systems are, are where majority of our goats from Australia come from. They originate on a property to which the animals are then transported. So they can either be transported to a goat depot between properties or direct to the processor. Those animals are transported with your My MLA livestock um, vendor declaration from your property ID, so your pick where that property originates from. Um, they could be sent to a goat depot and John Bloor is gonna be talking a lot more about goat depots tonight and the, the pivotal role that they play within the supply chain. Um, or they could be sent to a processor and we're lucky enough to have Paul Leonard on the line from TFI who will be talking from a processor's perspective tonight as well. From there, those goats are then um, either going to enter our domestic market, so that's the goat meat that we can buy domestically in Australia, or it will be exported overseas. The majority of our goat that we produce in Australia, 90% of it is exported to overseas markets, mainly in the US, um, Caribbean and Southeast Asia. And so that 10% market, um, we're lucky to have Michael Leopardi on the line, is gonna be talking about where that goes domestically and what that looks like and the opportunities domestically as well. So it's a really great um, supply chain that we're gonna be talking to you about. We're also really keen to make sure that you as producers not only understand the supply chain, but also how what you do on farm can actually dictate what goes through across the whole supply chain and how important that is for both processes, but also the end consumer. Because without knowing what the end consumer wants, we won't have a market to, um, to sell goat meat into. So it's really important that you have an understanding on, on the whole supply chain. And hopefully with, um, with a bit of science underpinned by Dr. Jared Lees, who's on the line, you'll get a real appreciation for how we can actually influence goat eating quality to make sure that that consumer gets a really good experience when eating Australian goat meat and that's what they demand. Just the next slide, please, Bridget. So first up, we have Michael Leopardi. Michael is a um, 
a goat producer from South Australia. He runs a four stud and a dairy goat stud with properties in the Adelaide Hills and the Tallinn Bend in South Australia. Michael's going to explain his own production system as well as provide insights into his wholesale business where he sources goats from local producers as well as breeding his own. And he has them processed at a local abattoir and then delivers to local customers across South Australia. Please welcome Michael. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's Michael Leopardi, and I'll just give you a brief history. Uh, uh, probably first started in uh, goat farming in 1998 um, at our home property in Adelaide Hills. We had a lot of woody weed problems and things. So I first, we first got a few goats, and uh, but the main problem was just containing them to the property, and it was pretty difficult. And uh, eventually, I got some better fencing in place, and that was mostly successful in containing them and so uh, I had started with some uh, sort of uh, rangeland cross type females and then I thought well if I could contain them I might as well breed them so then I bought a, uh, a full blood imported genetic uh, boar buck and then I found that uh, he was much easier to contain and then the does would mainly stick with him so then we sort of ramped up our numbers a bit and went on from there with the goats. And, um, but gradually over time, uh, I changed my focus to all full blood animals. So I uh, done away with most of the crossbreds and um, bought in some more full blood females and then bred on from there and built up a herd and then went on to uh, run goats on other property share farming as well. But with uh, just the change in the times and always along the way, I'd always have people asking me for goat meat. So I always uh, supplied goat meat on a small scale. I'd have it killed at an abattoir and uh, they had a delivery service at that abattoir and I'd have it uh, then delivered out to a butcher shop or something and then people could pick it up from there. But I found it was pretty time consuming and uh, sort of disjointed a bit. So I really continued on with the stud game with the animals uh, for quite a while. But then the dynamics have changed pretty well in the last couple of years with the pandemic, uh, with the just the demand and the cost of shipping overseas has been prohibitive. So the, there just hasn't been the amount of breeder stock going overseas. So I've swung more into uh, the meat side of things and uh, focusing mainly uh, my business model's gone to uh, just supplying. I've got an Asian grocery store that buys from me every week and uh, they take between 20 and 30 carcasses a week depending on the time of year and it's uh, so I swapped to a, another abattoir which is much closer to home and I purchased a uh, uh, an accredited cool room trailer for food transport so that way I could do my own deliveries which made it just a lot more faster to get faster turnover with everything. So uh, my business model is mainly I'll, I'll uh, pick up from uh, various suppliers and uh, I'll pick them up today, drop them to the abattoirs in the afternoon and they'll be killed tomorrow morning. And then the following day, I'll pick them up from the abattoirs in the cool room and deliver them to the, uh, to the uh, Asian grocery. And from there also, if I've got private orders, people will come to my home and collect them from the back of the cool room. And uh, I've supplied various uh, people over the years, but it's mainly now I've just focused in on uh, one particular group of people, which is uh, Bhutanese and Nepalese customers. And they're my main customers now. And I've found them uh, the, the type of goat they want and they're, they're happy to pay a, a premium price for that product because it's the closest product that they can get here that's what they were traditionally used to eating in their in their homeland. So, and uh, the property here in the Adelaide Hills, uh, recently I uh, just added on, so by buying a 300 acre block at Tail and Bend, which is sort of the, uh, the Mallee, more like a Mallee region, whereas Adelaide Hills is much higher rainfall and it's really not suitable um, for goats in the winter time. It's way too, too much rainfall and too cold. So the goats haven't done, don't do so well here all year round. Uh, 
on. So um, with the business, I've just aimed at keeping my business as simple as possible. And I've found that the uh, first profit I make on the, on the goat meat is my best profit. Uh, I have and still do a little bit of uh, getting a butcher to cut and pack meat and supply meat and stuff, but I find it's just, it's way too time consuming by the time you've got to then, you know, deliver a carcass to the butcher, get him to cut and pack it, then deliver it to the consumer, then wait to get paid and I've got to pay everyone else. And it's just, uh, there's not enough, uh, not enough margin in it for, in a small way, whereas just within, the few hours I can spend on the on the whole carcass uh, business, it's much more profitable for the amount of time I put into it. So that's how I've still done it. And um, as far as the goats go, of most breeds of goats are suitable for the job. Uh, at the top of the range, there's a lot my own uh, full blood boar weathers. And um, that's probably the best if you if anyone wanted to have a business of selling to uh, Australian consumers, because it presents very similar to a lamb carcass or lamb cuts. If you cut it up, you've got all the similar cuts, so it's easier to sort of uh, get an Australian person to eat goat meat if it's a boar carcass. But the, the, but the people who buy the most of the goat from me, they're not so worried about that, and so then I can use I use it. Uh, dairy goats. Uh, a few people have been sourcing uh, dairy goat weathers from dairies and rearing them and turning them out and uh, continuing to grow them out on pastures and, and some supplementary feeding. And I've found that's been a really good product for my business. It's uh, at the same carcass weight as a boar goat. If you had a 20 kilo uh, boar goat and a, and, and a 20 kilo sarnan, I find that the sarnan has got a um, a finer bone structure, so I suppose uh, Paul would relate to that with the, the cubing uh, business when you cube up the goat meat. It presents better because you've got a piece of meat and bone, whereas if you've got a larger boar goat carcass, it's a heavier boned animal. And uh, in a one-inch cube, you'll have cubes that are just, just bone only pretty much. And uh, other uh, pasture-fed rangeland goats are fine. I've tried rangeland goats off of the rangeland and uh, uh, customers were unimpressed. They just didn't like the flavour of it. So that was a, that's sort of a miss for me. So my business doesn't really uh, use many rangeland goats, basically none. And dairy cross, boar cross, or any combination is fine. Um, the only complaint I've ever really had about the meat is that it's either, it's either if it's on a really big animal, it's too fat, or if it's, um, I've had some complaints about if the animals were too young, that the meat is actually too tender for the, for the making curries and it doesn't uh, hold its, hold its uh, cube together very well. And uh, for me, the size of carcass I prefer is probably a 16, 25, and even up to 30 kilogram carcass is okay. Uh, the largest carcass I've ever processed, just out of curiosity value for people, was a, a very big, probably a five or six year old sun and weather, and it dressed out at 56 kilos. And I thought that there was no way I'd ever could sell it, but somebody bought it. So I was surprised. And for me, uh, because the killing fees are roughly about $25 an animal, um, so there's a, there's, it helps my margin if the goats are uh, over 20 kilos. So it's a much better proposition for me if they're 20 kilos plus. And uh, yeah, there we go. So yeah, mainly my, all my customers are, are Hindu people and they'll be Nepalese or uh, Bhutanese and they buy the cube meat from the supermarket. Um, they prepare that on site. And uh, a lot of the attraction of the premium quality carcass there is that the people can actually see the, the whole carcass or the joint of meat uh, before it's cubed up. So they sort of uh, like to see it there. And the, some of the customers will buy a, a whole portion and take it home and cut it up themselves to use in their curries. So the people like to actually see the meat there in front of them. 
and this is basically i think that the um goats the bigger they get you know they they do get fatter but um which is a bit of a problem but not always too fat if the goats are coming off a of good feed and everything uh they can still be really well filled out without being overly fat but the bigger the goat the more fat it's got um, Michael, you've got some really great images as part of your presentation slide. Do you want to just, in the last few minutes, talk about what what goats are in the images? Okay, so the images right in front, that's what I'd say is the choice of sort of goat. They are full blood boar goat carcasses there, and you can see the like the profile of the butt, and then you look from the tail running back along the spine, how full they are in the rump, and, you know, well... And the evenness of the fat cover off on the boar goat carcass is the most, uh, even when they are fat, the fat is very even compared to other breeds. So, yeah, that's the, that would be the ideal fat cover and size there in that photograph in front of you now. So if you want to swap to another slide, that's a, a similar boar goat carcass getting at the top range of the fat cover there. You can see how much fat's on that one quite a bit. But if you want to age a carcass, it needs to have that fat if you want to, if you wanted to supply a restaurant or something like that. Whereas now the next uh, picture here, there's some dairy uh, goat weathers, uh, Bisanum weathers in that photo there. And the meat's a little bit darker colour and it's got less fat, but it's still got the right taste and it presents well once it's cubed up. So uh, even though that looks a, a different product, at the end of the day, my customers are just as pretty much just as happy with that carcass as they are with the boar goat one. Again, like uh, prime boar goat carcasses there. And you can sort of see the, the meat colour is a bit lighter in colour and, and just that really even fat, just like it's been painted on them, really even. There's some more uh, goats there, probably the ones on the right-hand side are, are more boar goat content and the ones to the left are, are, are crossbreed boars. Just another shot uh, comparing the difference between the ones on the left there would be crosses or sarnans and the ones to the right are more higher content ball goat. Same again, so you can see the nice uh, fat cover on those ones there at that size. It's a good size at 18 kilos and it presents well. So there's some pictures there of a few uh, breeding goats running around. Back at the very beginning. There, there's a, that's my breeder herd there. And these are, that's another friend's uh, flock of goats at Langhorn Creek. And he runs them in conjunction. He manages it. They've got 200 hectare vineyard there. And so he just uses them to uh, eat down some of the grass around the vineyard when the vines are dormant. And they have got some sections of vines that have become sort of obsolete. And um, so they're just turn that totally over to grazing goats now and it suits them just with their operation in the vineyard. And then uh, most of their slaughter stock I purchased from them. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Michael, for that great insight into someone who's very successful in developing goats for the domestic market and filling that need for, um, I guess, the goat cuisine in a multicultural uh, local domestic market as well and yeah, utilizing a range of breeds as well yeah the goat business is that you know i mean it's a pretty specialized little niche market it's just something i started up as a part-time business but it's it sort of suits uh it suits it's a fill in with uh, other things on the farm so it's it's been uh, quite a good little business for me and yeah, my suppliers great. across the state are just they're mainly just similar people to us people with small farms and and smaller goat herds yeah, so I think it's a really good insight and, and case study to your personal experience of, of how you're servicing the domestic market for tonight's webinar. Next, we're going to, um, so thank you very much, Michael, really appreciate it. We've um, got some questions for you in the Q&A. We might be able to respond to some of those now and we might hold off on a couple that we might answer live um, at the end of the webinar.
Next, we'll jump on to our, our second speaker of the night. We've got John Bloor. John runs Belmont Station near Broken Hill. And in 2015, he established Silverton Goat Depot, which buys and sells rangeland goats. John's going to provide an insight into goat depots in general and their role that they play within the goat industry. So please welcome John and his presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, I uh, should have somewhere where I can adjust the slides here, Bridget. Oh, yep. There we are. Um, yeah, tonight, everyone, I'm just going to talk about what a goat depot does and uh, why people use them. And these are just based on my observations over the last sort of eight years, as um, I don't have. Uh, uh, all the knowledge on, on markets and that sort of thing. I'm just sort of what I've picked up over the last few years. But uh, generally what a goat depot does is it buys small lots of goats um, at a live weight price, um, direct, generally direct out of the wild. So 80% of our goats are just rangeland um, or used to be known as feral goats. Um, and most of these goats have never been in a yard before, have never had any animal husbandry uh, practices exerted on them. We probably 95 uh, to 100% of our goats are rangeland goats, um, but probably 20% of those might be, you know, managed in some way behind some sort of wire. Um, and we generally buy from a 250 kilometre, most depots sort of work on a, around that sort of 250, 300 kilometre radius of the, of the area that we're in, they're in. Um, and the functions of a depot are twofold. Uh, mainly the goat depot is about transport, transport consolidation. So when you're, you know, most of the goats in um, Australia are generally in areas that are a long way from export avatars. Um, so uh, we consolidate smaller lots of goats into more cost effective freight movements, you know, B doubles and road train transport. I give an example of this from Broken Hill to, uh, to uh, Thomas Foods in, in Lobethal, South Australia, you're probably looking at $4 a head on a B-double. Whereas if you were going to send 200 goats on a tray top truck, you're probably looking at $10 a head. 100 goats might be $20 a head. So there's a pretty big cost saving there um, in, the, in the transport department for, for people that are opportunity harvesting rangeland goats and, and want to get rid of them while they're fresh. Depot also uh, uh, its function is market distribution. So we can get goats in and have the facilities to draft them and uh, weigh them and separate them into their, uh, their weights and styles of goats and, and send them to the best market that, uh, for that particular type of goat. So those markets include the uh, skin off and skin on export market, the Australian domestic market, the live export market, and the uh, domestic restocker market. Um, generally goats get to the depot, uh, they, they'll come, we buy numbers from one to uh, thousand. So they'll come on utes and trailers. Um, we'll go pick them up in tray top trucks or single semi loads or, or B double loads, uh, depending on what the people do. Once they get to the depot, um, what happens here is First up, the goats are drafted according to sex and size. So billies are always separated from nannies uh, to prevent physical damage to the nannies when they when the rangeland goats have uh, um, very uh, vigorous in their in their mating techniques. So uh, uh, if you don't separate, if you leave the goats yard and don't separate the billies from the nannies, then uh, you can end up losing a lot of nannies. Uh, the same thing goes for uh, when holding goats, you know, uh, for long periods of time, the smaller billies need to be separated from the bigger billies to uh, to keep everything fairly healthy. Um, we'll also draft nannies into lines of slaughter nannies and and restocker nannies. So um, nannies that are very light in condition that aren't going to yield well or might go underweight at, at an export abattoir or are heavily pregnant, they'll be drafted off and and uh, tagged. Um, and they can be grown out or traded as restockers. Mixed sex wiener goats, um, so that the lighter end that's too small for uh, processing. 
they'll they'll be tagged and paddocked in large paddocks to grow out or either traded on to restockers. And then slaughter billies and nanny slaughter nannies are uh, generally let out into holding paddocks um, so that they're not held around yards too long to fret and lose weight. Um, any goats in the pad in the uh, depot for longer than ten days are also tagged. Um, the slaughter goats can be drafted into skin on and skin off, depending on market uh, conditions and, and market available fuel space and that sort of thing. Um, all goats, all goats that come into the depot that are sort of over the, the 20 kilos live weight can be killed skin off. And there's a good market for uh, skin off rangeland goats in the US, um, also in Canada and the Caribbean. And generally, the Australian rangeland goat is what um, the end consumers, which, you know, in the end consume 80 odd percent, 90 percent of Australia's goat meat, that's what they're after. Um, in the past, Australian export processes have preferred high dress weight um, goats because it reduces the killing costs per, per kilo of meat. But currently, the lot of weight goats are easier to sell. Um, so I've sort of, you know, I've come to the, the idea that breeding goats to be heavier and fatter isn't necessarily what the uh, consumer market wants or, or the consumer market for, for 90, 80, 90% of our, our goat, Australian goat meat. Um, skin on slaughter, um, for those who don't know what that is, it's, it's putting the goat similar to a pig in hot water um, and all the hair comes out through a tumbler and, and uh, the last bits with a knife. And that's traditionally eaten by the Asian cultures. Uh, there's a considerable market for skin on goat meat in the US for the under 16 kilo bracket, so the smaller end of the goats. Um, but goats can be killed up to 24 kilo skin on. Uh, but that market, that 16 to 24 kilo market is a lot smaller. It's generally uh, Asia, Taiwan and Japan and Korea. Any, any goats that are bred over 45 kilos live weight have got to be killed skin off. Um, the world uh, market for skin on goat meat is a lot smaller than the market for skin off goat meat. So uh, it's not like you can go and kill all the goat skin on because you, you collapse the market. But um, it, it's, it's, there's certain people that just want to eat goat with the skin on. Uh, we also sell at the Australian domestic market and, and basically everything that we sell at the Australian domestic market, um, either skin on or skin off is, is under 16 kilo dressed. And generally they're looking for uh, eight to 12 kilo goats in that lighter end um, of the market. Um, in the past, we have have sent goats live weight, uh, like uh, live to Malaysia, so um, live export. Uh, but as the price increased, that sort of market uh, fell away because they couldn't compete with the price. There's a lot of work involved in this and uh, there's a lot more risk financially uh, compared to selling to uh, reputable Australian abattoir. Um, but, uh, you know, it is, it is an option for the medium to medium heavy billies. Um, might ask yourself, why would people send a large mob of goats to a, to a depot? Well, infrastructure constraints uh, are generally uh, why depots are needed. Goats need a lot of um, expensive infrastructure to be able to handle them properly. Many properties, you know, the terrain is is bad, and and the properties are isolated, and um, goats are difficult to muster from the rangelands. So, um, uh, it, sometimes it's more cost effective to uh, go to a depot to move the goats quickly because uh, if they're held for long periods of time, they can melt um, very quickly. Um, they fret in a yard, so the general cons consensus is to get wheels under them as soon as you can, and uh, Get them to a depot where there's infrastructure to uh, to uh, separate them and and uh, let them have feed and water and that sort of thing. Another reason that uh, depots are important is because uh, when people go to do a goat muster in the rangelands, uh, you know conditions uh, they don't always know what they're going to come up with with a muster. So uh, in the rangelands, goats can move from one property to the other. Um, uh, you know, most of New South Wales isn't controlled by um, total grazing pressure fences. Um, generally, there's a lot of plain wire sheep fences and, and goats can move from one, one property to another. And they, 
they hang in small mobs. So it's hard to estimate what you're going to muster until you actually put them together, which makes booking ahead at the tour space, you know, a bit difficult. Whereas for the Goat Depot, you can handle the, the uh, fluctuations. You know, someone might think they're going to muster 200 goats and come up with 1,000, or they might think they're going to muster 1,000 and come up with 200. So um, depots can uh, smooth out that, uh, that supply supply line to the export abattoirs. Um, yeah, uh, and, and as I said before, you, if you muster the goats and move them quickly, you can keep them fresh. Um, sometimes mustering plans are brought forward or pushed back uh, without uh, you know, much notice. And uh, the depot is quite flexible for taking uh, all sorts of goats. So um, some producers that are, you know, might be focusing on uh, merino sheep or, or other uh, species want to sell all their goats. And uh, a goat depot can take all weights of goats from, um, from uh, big enough to walk on a truck to uh, all the goats and, and draft them and find a, a market for, for all the different types, um, ages, sexes, weights. Uh, so that's pretty well it. Thanks, Mel. Wonderful. Thanks, John. That was a really great insight into goat depots and where a lot of our rangeland goats go into before they go to the processes. Um, so thanks very much for that insight. You've got some questions in the, the Q&A that I'll um, let you address or we can answer them at the end of the, of the webinar during the, the live Q&A session. Thanks. Um, our, no worries. Our next speaker is Paul Leonard. Paul is the Livestock Manager at Thomas Foods International is based out of South Australia. John's going to provide a, an update and give an insight into goat meat processing, but also an overview of the current market challenges and an update on the Burke facility. So welcome, Paul. Thanks, Melanie, and uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Look, there was just five points I wanted to touch on tonight. Firstly, I feel like touch on very lightly uh, who Thomas Feeds International are. I was going to talk uh, briefly about our Burke uh, facility acquisition in New South Wales, and I'll just touch on the markets, um, what the consumers are asking for, and um, finally, perhaps a little bit on grids and where we see the market going in the future. So just quickly, um, Thomas Foods International are a 100% uh, Australian-owned family business based here in South Australia. We have four plants currently in, uh, spread out across Australia uh, from Tamworth in New South Wales. And these are the sheep and lamb plants, uh, Lobethal in South Australia, uh, Stall in Victoria, and of course, more recently, Burke with goats in Western New South Wales. And uh, in February, 2023, we will uh, commission our brand new uh, beef processing facility at Murray Bridge that unfortunately uh, burnt down four or five years ago. And that'll be a state-of-the-art beef processing facility, the most state-of-the-art um, beef processing facility in the Southern Hemisphere. So um, we're really proud about that. Um, we also have international offices, um, primarily in North America at Philadelphia, where we have a, a major value-adding facility there where we've invested heavily over the last decade. And a lot of our product, be it our goat, our beef, lamb and mutton, goes through that facility in Philadelphia, or at Swedesboro, just outside Philadelphia, where we value add a lot of our product, and uh, and uh, we uh, we we work with the major retailers and pack in their their cartons for them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I'll touch a bit on that uh, further uh, down the track. But we also have businesses in the Netherlands, uh, China, Japan, or offices, I should say, um, Canada, um, the UK, and more recently Singapore. So. Uh, that's a little bit of a story of who we are, but we are very much, you know, we, we, we were talking earlier today, we talk about, people talk about vertical, vertical integration, they talk about conception, consumption and paddock to plate and all the rest of it. But, uh, you know, Thomas Foods is a processing business in Australia that, that truly does live that, that standard right from owning uh, primary production properties in the southeast of South Australia through to the processing facilities further the value adding, and then of course, marketing all our own meat in-house. So we very rarely use traders outside the business and uh, we do that to try obviously to extract as much value as we can. So it's a little bit about Thomas Food. So Burke, 
Um, Burke was a, an interesting acquisition. It was, uh, it was a business that we probably really didn't go looking for. And if it was uh, three years ago, if you'd asked us the question, would we have purchased a, be pro a uh, goat processing facility at Burke, the answer may have been no. Um, but it was a sliding door moment for the business when the, uh, the previous owners that built the facility at Burke, and you can see uh, it looks a little bit different even today than that, that, that photo shows. But when you think of a, Burke, a, 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 a goat, abattoir at Burke, it don't, doesn't really come to mind that it's a massive <coughs> setup like it is. It really is, really, it is state of the art for a goat facility. It, it enables to do both skin on and skin off. Um, it has massive capacity, it has capacity to up to 6,000 uh, small stock a day there. And I'm not for one minute suggesting we're going to get there in a hurry, but it was certainly by the previous owners, they had a lot of vision and they built it big and they built it for the long term. So. Um, the opportunity came up when uh, the previous um, owners, unfortunately, had a massive drought on their hand when they built the facility. And then, of course, it rained and they, they made a decision to, um, to uh, exit the industry. And uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to buy the facility. In that period of time, really over the last, which is 14 months ago, um, these things take time. And uh, we've learned that, you know, time is our friend, really, because there's no good fighting uh, father time. So... In that period of time we've um, installed, it's really been about uh, remedial work. We've installed um, hot water makeup tanks. Uh, we've replaced the uh, LNP gas, uh, LNG gas with LNP gas, um, which will be a massive cost and reduction to us from a utilities perspective. Um, there's been other work around dust suppression, irrigation and all the rest of it, but probably around the future with Burke, uh, over the next 12 months, we'll intend to um, implement the plate freezing on site which it doesn't have currently in cold storage and also on-site rendering and when we're able to do that and that will take 12 months that but that will give that facility the capacity uh if, if needed to go to 5,000 small stock a day um but we will need to get the on-site plate freezing and uh, obviously the rendering to be able to achieve that um we've made some other acquisitions um in the town we uh as a business uh, the business um purchased a 60 bed accommodation complex that was called the back of Burke. And we bought that specifically to be able to house our interstate workers. And also um, we started uh, through the Palm Agreement to uh, bring some people over from the Pacific Islands, et cetera. And that's something both skilled and unskilled workers that will continue to do over the next six months as we, as we continue to build. Um, currently really for the last uh, few months, we have just been killing minimal numbers of goats and we've done that for a reason and the reason for that is we're still trying to get our USDA accreditation and as John said earlier and Melanie if you haven't got a US, US license if you can't go to the States you're really not in the business certainly from a volume perspective and these things take time and we expect at this stage we're hoping to have it in late January or, or certainly by the middle of February. Um, but there's a lot involved in, in, in acquiring a uh, USDA accreditation and so there should be all our, all our other facilities in Australia do have that. And it's a, you know, it's a very difficult accreditation to get. It's probably even harder to hold, uh, but uh, you know, we, we export a lot of meat. As I said, we have our own investment in the States. And of course, you've got to adhere to the protocols, processes and practices that the US uh, set for Australian exporters to go into their country. So it's really around about, um, the cold chain temperatures, sustainable work practices, sanitation requirements, all these things. So they just take time. So we're working along that now. Um, so we're hoping that by, uh, hopefully by, you know, at least with the Christmas break, mid to late February at the latest, uh, we've been able to achieve that. And at that point, as soon as we get that, we'll be able to certainly ramp up to at least hopefully 1,500 goats a day there. And we'd hope within six months after that, a couple of thousand a day and hopefully 12 months time from that period of time, we'd, we'd hope to settle it somewhere around about 3,000 um, go today at that facility. And that's the sort of numbers that need to go through that facility, facility to make it work. So um, we're very confident that that will happen. Um, and I think finally, just on Burke, and I think that the other important thing, I think that, you know, whilst there's, uh, there's plenty of other good competitors and we always respect our competitors, but I think the one thing that's been lacking uh, has been another major goat processor out in the goat-centric country. We've got Charlotte up the road. And I think now that, that, that once the bird gets rolling, it will enable people to save, as John said earlier, on those freight costs. They are massive. Um, really, once you go past probably Charlotte at the moment, you've got to really come down here to South Australia where we've got a facility at Lomathool or you've got to go through to Victoria. 
where the other facilities are from an export perspective. So um, hopefully Burke will enable some options for people um, and certainly a, a freight saving. And also, I guess, from an animal welfare perspective, uh, all these things are becoming more front and centre as, as each year goes past. So uh, being able to perhaps not have to cart the goats or livestock as far as we previously had to uh, may help everyone along the supply chain. Um, so that's Burke. Um, on markets, just checking my timing. On markets, uh, excuse me. That's pretty. Oh, I forgot to start that thing, so not to worry. On markets, the, the question plenty I put here. Time, Paul. Plenty of Sorry. time. Have You've I? Got okay. plenty of time. Thank you. So on markets, um, <clears throat> the first question I asked here is, why has the goat market had such a severe correction? And I just hope today that I might be able to answer, I guess, from a processor's perspective, um, some of those answers for you. But of course, the first one was, I think it's first the, the, the put right up front. There's no doubt, I don't think anybody disagree that obviously coming out of the drought five years ago, that goats did get historically very expensive. And I don't think anybody's expected them to sit it in that eight to $10 range forever. That was never going to happen. But at the same token, I didn't think anyone, and including us as processors, saw the correction coming that we saw the last two months, where you've got goats now four to five dollars and some places cheaper. <clears throat> and it's been driven by a real slowing of the US economy that none of us saw coming this quickly. We saw it coming, but it really stopped. And um, I know from our perspective, and I know that plenty of other processes, we have many, many weeks and in fact months of product in the States in cold storage and freezing currently and, and other goat on the water. And to a level that really the last month that uh, you know our customers or our uh, salespeople have said, look, please just stop. Let us work through this current inventory that we have. We're coming into the North American uh, winter. And of course, the burn rate then will be much greater than it's been uh, through the summer. And people will eat more stews and hot pots and different things of this nature. So one reason has been obviously the, 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 uh, the, in the interest rate rises in the economy. That's, and the slowing has created this large inventory. But I think we'll work through, it, through that over the next three or four months. Um, as processes ourselves, I said, if we'd have seen that coming, we would have probably pulled up three or four months ago ourselves and, and perhaps dropped prices or, or process less goats. So I think it took everyone by surprise. But anyhow, that's a situation we're all in, but it is very much a short-term situation. The other thing not helping is the drought in North America. It's enabling some of those consumers that would have consumed goat and mutton and perhaps some of the lower value cuts of land to switch back to cheaper proteins like trim, beef trim, which is mint. Um, with that drought over there, uh, no different to what we were here six years ago when cows weren't worth a lot of money. No one's buying them for breeding. They're dumping a lot of female cattle, unfortunately, over there. And of course, they're very, very cheap in the grinding beef. So that's the other thing we're competing against at the moment. And of course, that'll fix itself as well. Um, and hopefully as they come into their uh, winter this year, let's hope North America does get a big break from this massive drought they've got. And they will go from having an excess of cheaper value uh, beef to quite the opposite. Now, I would imagine be back back here wanting to buy a lot more grass beef. And uh, you can imagine those uh, commodity type um, products like grinding beef and that you would imagine would go through the roof, but the drought's got a break. And I guess finally, the other thing that we've, the other thing we've seen also in the last, really only the last three weeks, we've seen mutton take this massive correction that goat took six weeks ago and it's followed sweet. And if you look back historically, other than the last two or three years, mutton and goat always followed a fairly similar trajectory. They were always particularly light mutton, six weight mutton, mutton 24 kilos down, um, because they, they were always, um, the, the people that are consuming the goat would consume mutton um, just as quick, the plain of mutton, the lean of mutton was on, they didn't have fat on them. So it's only been the last few years that that really got out of kilter where mutton, uh, goats were up here and mutton were there. So all of a sudden we've seen mutton really correct in the last two or three weeks from five or five and a half dollars back to anywhere in the Victorian markets and lighter sheep from $2.50 and heavy sheep up to probably $3.50 or 80. So that's been a massive correction. So that's the other thing that goat in the short term will also compete with is cheap mutton. <clears throat> and the reason the mutton's got cheap, of course, is the China market uh, has been you know, quite suppressed over the last six months in particular. And of course, you know, previous to that for the last four years, it was just wonderful to have China access and it still is, but it was even more wonderful then because it was a really premium market on Australian mutton. 
And um, of course, through the, the lockdown business and all the rest of it, that's just slowed and slowed and slowed and, and obviously access into the country. So we hope that perhaps up the track that that may ride itself as well. So there's three or four things that I think can turn around and will turn around. It's just a matter of time and when. Um, so I suppose just looking forward, where will the markets be? You know, I think you're going to see go, you know, depressed probably for perhaps six months because you've also got this build-up of goats that haven't been processed in Australia over the last, you know, eight or ten weeks. We've gone from forty to fifty thousand goats a week back to ten to fifteen thousand goats being processed each week, as most of us processors can't get orders into North America for your skin off goats and the only really market has been the skin on goat up into Asia. So for that reason, you've got that build up and then we'll come into the Australian summer and of course there'll be a turn off. So I can't see it riding itself in the very short term, but certainly if we can get through to the middle of next year onwards and it might be six to eight months, but you know, I think that it's gone from one extreme to the other and I'm very confident that it'll, it'll meet somewhere in the middle at some point. It won't stay down here for too long, I don't think. So be confident. Uh, it's just a hiccup and there's really genuine reasons um, for that hiccup, which I think I've explained. And once a few of those things write themselves, um, you'll, see the, you'll see the market turn around and, uh, and, and away it will go again. I'm not saying goats are going to get back to $8 or $10, but I think they're going to settle somewhere between where they were and where they are. Um, so that's a little bit on the market. So really from our perspective, just as a processor, you know, what is the ideal goat? And, uh, you know, if we go back uh, four or five years before we got the real shortage of guts, um, the most processors were 10 to 20 kilos was their ideal gut. And I'd still say for our perspective, that's still the case. And when goats got harder to procure, we sort of came down to eight kilos up. And then goats got harder to procure and we went down to six kilos up. But really, we've moved back from our perspective, actually today, we've gone eight kilos up again because it's really not excuse me, and our benefit to kill six to eight kilo dress weight goats, a lot of them do end up getting pulled down the chain. They're too small, they're too poor, they're too light, they're too young. And I think from a producer's perspective, you don't really want to be selling goats that are dressing six and seven kilos anyhow. You should be trying to retain those goats and um, evaluate them further up the track brief and put some more weight in them. So we're going back to eight kilos up, which is more what our customers are requiring. And really a 22 kilo goat's really around the top end of where you want to be. Now, not that there's any specific weight range in goats because as mentioned earlier, all our goats that go to North America, they're all cubed. So they're cubed bone in. So um, they effectively, I said, they're like, like eating duck at the Chinese when you've got the bone in the middle and they, kick, they cube them into one inch by one inch by one inch square cube individual pieces of meat with the bone in the middle. And they'll sell them in a one kilo or a five kilo bag of cubed goat. And then people will put them in their curries, et cetera. Um, so it's not really about that they care whether they're 10 or 12 or 14 or 18 or 24 kilos dressed. But the real worry is if you get goats too much over 22 or three kilos individually, they'll start getting fat. And the one thing that they don't like uh, is fat on goats. Uh, the, the consumers, which are the Hispanic population, in particular the African and Indian population in North America, which is the main consumer of our goats that go to North America, they love the leanness and they love the taste of goats. So we want to be really careful as an industry that we don't start holding them a bit like letting your steers out of the channel country for another year and bring them back as bullocks next year because we don't have a market unlike lamb that can handle heavy lamb to some degree and beef that can handle bullocks. Uh, there's not a market for a fat goat. So just keep that in mind. Um, be careful that you don't hold them for too long if they're gonna get fat. So our perfect goat is probably 10 to 20 kilos, but we'll take them 18 to 22 and they'll probably eight to 22, I apologize. And there'll be some penalties out either side of that. When we get going, with some numbers at Burke. And as I said, that's not gonna happen until February or, or onwards next year. What can a producer do to maximize value? You know, what's in your control that's not in our control that can help us and help our end consumers that can inevitably add value further down the chain to you? Well, the first thing I'd say is buy a set of scales. Um, you know, you see most of the top end land producers these days either have scales or their stock agents have scales. And it's really important moving forward that you do draft your goats into the right specific specific weight range. And with the understanding that most goats will dress anywhere from 
40 to 46 percent of their live weight well it's not too hard to work out if you know where you've got to be on a dress weight basis if you're trying to target eight to 20 kilos and you don't want to send in goats that are 7.6 and 7.7 particularly to us and then get nothing for them if you've got a set of scales you can really weigh your goats and, and maximize that you are retaining those goats that are worthless to us but are worth quite a lot of money to you perhaps four or five months later and also on the top end, if you know your goats are getting too heavy, you might be able to draft them individually. They can weigh those scales individually, weigh these days and, and get them out of there. So buy a set of scales. It'll be the cheapest investment you ever make. I think it's been magnificent the, the way people have invested in exclusion fencing. I know that's been very expensive. And I think for the sake of a five or $8,000 set of scales for the many hundreds of thousands that you've spent on fencing, I think it's a no-brainer. Um, we think it's fantastic that people have invested in exclusion fencing. It's changed the whole nature of the goat industry. It gave us the confidence of the business to buy Berg because, you know, back in the day, you couldn't rely on really running a business like that on the, as John said earlier, if, if contract musters went out in national parks, they may have got 10,000, they might have got 1,000. Very hard to run a business like that as a pure play goat business. Um, but now that people are managing their goats behind, well, we know they'll be more consistent and an orderly sell-off of goats. And I think that's what the industry has been looking for to mature to this next level, to get people like Thomas Foods and others to continue to invest further in goat-centric facilities. Um, invest in your better genetics. And I think that is really important. As I said, be careful you don't go too far to the to um, just weights and yield and, and then running into fat, but also bear in mind fertility, because sometimes the value you might get when the value of goats comes down might be running more it for a shorter period of time at a lower value rather than running less at a higher value. So always remember fertility. Sometimes you can breed your way through the job when market's correct by running 20% more stock and you may still end up with a similar return that perhaps you did the 12 months before at a slightly higher value. And I think finally, the great thing about goats that we all should bear in mind is from a seasonality perspective, they are just fantastic. There's not too many other breeds of protein in Australia that you can run 12 months of the year and know that over that whole period of time, whether it's floods, droughts or rain, that they're a, they're a marketable commodity. You know, you can't do it with lambs. You need to finish a lamb. You need to finish beef. Um, but goats have this wonderful capacity to be able to graze. They don't need drain assistance and uh, they don't need crops planted from all the rest of it. So I think we want to bear that in mind that, that, that it's a very unique product. And I think just finally, just bear in mind, keep confident in the industry. You know, it's a widely consumed meat. It's, uh, you know, we're not in the EMU industry here. This isn't some fad that's been boom and bust. It's a short-term pickup and there's genuine reasons for why that is. But I think the long, the medium, I think the long-term future for goats is very, very good. Thanks, Mel. Wonderful. Thanks, Paul. I think there's some really great um, take-home messages there that producers can really apply almost tomorrow. Um, to try and actually get some continuation across the supply chain and, and what they can get out of that uh, event, um, which is really great. So thanks very much, Paul, for those processing insights. Our next speaker and final speaker for tonight, before we jump into our Q&A, is Dr. Jared Lees. Jared is currently the Head of Animal Research and Trials for E Shepherd. However, he's previously worked for UNE Meat Science team researching eating quality of red meat industry. And before that, he worked as part of the MSA team um, at Meat and Livestock Australia in engagement and business development. Jared recently completed a research project investigating whether farmed high quality goat meat can be differentiated by consumers as effectively as beef and lamb can be. So Jared's bringing a different aspect to the supply chain tonight to really complement our other speakers. So please welcome Jared. Thanks, Mel. All right, I'll, uh, I'll crack into it. Um, so yeah, tonight I just want to talk to you. It's it's obviously very niche. So I think the, uh, you've really nailed the lineup for this, Mel. It's um, it's good to see we've had a good good heap of the rangeland stuff with a bit of uh, with a bit of carcass stuff in there, and, and that's where we want to go with this one. Um, I pinched this slide off Pete McGilchrist, um, but essentially I think it really nails it. It's, you know, a customer's the most important visitor on our planet. He's not dependent on us, we're dependent on him. He's not an interruption to our work, he's the purpose of it. He's not an outsider to our business, he's a part of it. 
and we're not doing him a favour by serving him, he's doing us a favour by giving us the opportunity to do so. So I'm not actually sure if Gandhi did that but um, or said that, but I think it, it paints a really good picture um, for how we need to make sure the consumer always sits, sits front of mind when we're making decisions on farm. So today, and look, sheep's a dirty word in, in this group, I know, or with some people anyway, but I'm going to I'm going to talk about the sheep meat story and where they were sort of 25 years ago, um, because I think there's some learnings in that that we can take away and apply to the goat meat industry. I'll take you through the project that we did briefly um, and, and look at those sensory outcomes. So we actually fed goat meat to consumers. Um, and then in terms of future directions, just a few dot points around where I think we might need to to make sure we keep um, keeping our sights. So back in the late 90s, um, MLA did a retail audit and consumers were finding that there was a stack of sheep meat that they were just not happy with. Um, and one of the big drivers of that was tenderness. So you'll see on that uh, figure there, shear force down the bottom. Can you see my pointer? I think. Anyway, uh, shear force down the bottom. Um, and you can see that as it gets higher, um, we're in the red, not good. Uh, that's how much it takes to chew the meat, right? So they did a bit of a thing with that and worked out that, well, it was probably, it was probably cold shortening that was causing those issues. Um, so cold shortening, just to give you an idea, is when uh, the carcass is chilled too quickly uh, before it hits rigor mortis, the muscles contract really hard and become really tight. Um, and that causes a massive decrease in tenderness. The industry overcame that by simply installing electrical stimulation, um, brings down the pH quicker, the animals enter rigor mortis quicker, we can avoid cold shortening and we can get a far better eating quality experience. So you can see on the right there, that's, I think that's probably the best way to show it. We can see you've got consumer satisfaction over on the, on the side there. With stimulation, we're getting a hell of a lot better. And essentially that's what the lamb industry did and that's what they got in 2006. So not quite 10 years later, they found there was this marked improvement in shear force and a marked in improvement in consumer um, happiness, I guess, or satisfaction. So the other thing they did do, and I've not probably mentioned it, but um, they also started then really looking into their genetics and what they had. And I'll sort of briefly touch on that towards the end. Um, but uh, tenderness is also driven by, by the genetics of the animals. Essentially, the Meat Standards Australia program, if you're not familiar with it, utilises a bunch of critical control points. And that's what really drove the, the sheep meat industry um, to make these changes. So you've got pre-slaughter control, and that's where the producer really comes in. We've got things like genetics, so the things we know will impact eating quality. We've got an animal's age, the older they get, uh, generally, the, they lose tenderness, but they might gain some other factors. Their growth path that they're grown along, how they're sold, um, and then a big one is pre-slaughter stress, and that's been brought up a lot tonight, I've noticed. So if you want more information on that sort of stuff, I'd suggest just going straight to the MSA website, and you'll get a lot of, between the beef and the sheep meat side of things, you'll get a lot of um, thoughts and ideas around what might work. For you, there's been nothing done in goats that I'm aware of for Australia. So the other side of it then too is the post-slaughter control. And this is where this cold shortening idea came into it. So looking at hang method, but really looking into the chillers and then they looked into aging the meat. The cut or the primal has an impact on eating quality. And we all know that you buy different cuts, you cook them different ways because they're gonna eat differently. Um, and then looked at things like value adding and cooking method, but everything comes from conception right through to the the consumer right onto the dinner plate right and looking at tenderness juiciness flavor and overall liking so what we decided to do with this project was to apply that general idea and theme to goat meat and just see what consumers thought of it now i got twenty two thousand dollars it was through a bears but mla was the sponsor for that particular grant um and what we thought was, to, look, 22 grand in um, eating quality doesn't really go too far. So we thought, well, let's just focus on this high value domestic market and see if we can't get your average Caucasian Australian to see how they like goat meat and rate it for us. So we've got these 12 ball weathers. Um, Craig and Joe Stewart, thanks very much for, um, for working with us on this one. So we got some of their goats that were destined for slaughter. 
They were about 20 to 25 kilo carcass weight. Um, and they were a milk and tooth tooth article. So really, um, really driving home that young, young goat that should be um, reasonably good eating quality. And then with the cook methods, we chose, we chose roast, slow cook and grill. And the reason for that was MLA did some work a few years back and looked at how consumers rate goat meat or what they think of goat meat and if they eat it, why they eat it or why they don't eat it. And the reasons they didn't eat it was around familiarity with the product, but also it was around the availability of the product. They just couldn't get it, but they basically had said that if they could get a hold of it, they'd like to try it. So the idea was there, but they didn't really know how to cook it either. And so what we did, and this was brought up earlier, um, I think maybe Michael mentioned it, but essentially, if you can give consumers something they're familiar with in terms of, let's say a cook method, then it makes them feel a bit more comfortable that they're probably gonna do a pretty good job when they go to cook it. So we only cooked them ways that we thought they should be eaten. So we roasted shoulders, we roasted racks and we roasted legs. We slow cooked shoulders, legs and shanks, and we grilled the racks, the loins and the knuckles. Um, and we drew from our lamb experience. So you and eat, um, being uh, very big on the lamb eating quality front. We had a shared vision and a bloody good attitude. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, the thing that I kept hearing in Joe Stewart was probably <laughs> one of the most vocal was it's not just a curry and it's not. And so that's why we had those different ones. But we also took some lab measurements too. So we took that sheer force or that the, the amount of uh, force it takes to to break through the meat. And we took intramuscular fat percentage as well, because we saw that we know from lamb, it's a, it's a big driver of eating quality as well. As I said, we grilled, roasted and slow cooked and we used 60 consumers for each cook method. Now, normally you would have multiple groups of 60 consumers per cook method. But like I said before, um, we, we were short on cash and we wanted to get an idea of what was going on. So each consumer got one piece of meat that was a leveler. So something that set their palate. And then they got six pieces of meat to test in a random order. But every piece of meat was eaten by two different consumers. So that's a lot of consumers. So there was and a lot of pieces of meat. That's just to show you the rough idea of how we did it. But you can see here, the picture on the left there, you've got all these different bits of meat. So that's 10 sets of samples. Um, and then they get placed on the grill in that exact order. And that's sort of how we know that, that sample came from that, that goat and it was this particular cut of meat. And so we put that onto the grill and then we feed it out to the consumers. From a slow cook perspective, um, we, we fried them off and then we cooked them in these bain maries in a little pot um, in a broth. And then that was taken off the bone and served to the, served to the consumer or where there was bone in the, in the meat. So into the results, um, and that's some of our some of our cuts there. So you can see that you know it's a it, it's a pretty good product. It's lean, it's red, it's it's one of those products. So that's that's some of the stuff that we we sell it on, right? It's a lean red meat that that will be a healthy alternative for you. So realistically, in terms of the carcass weights, um, I've done I've done the wrong thing there, top right. Yeah, look. I've done something wrong. Anyway, a nine to 19 millimeters, that was supposed to be for the um, GR fat, the 21 to 25 was supposed to be for the carcass weight, but regardless, you get the idea. So these carcasses had a good layer of fat over the, over the girth rib, the GR site. Um, and we basically hit that market spec that, that um, Joe and Craig really, really aimed for as it is. You can see down the bottom there, your shear force, there's a decent spread there. Um, I can get that up, yep. And so it's that group there that we were like, well, you know what, maybe these were cold shortened. Um, the, the chilling that these animals went through was quite hard. Um, so even though they had that fat cover, I still think that probably played a, played a role in it. Um, and you can see the intramuscular fat percentage on the bottom right there was 1.6 to 7.7. So I think the average for lamb in the, in the resource flocks that, that go through the genetic testing, I think the average is around five or five and a half percent. Um, so a lot lower IMF than what a lamb has. Um, but again, I think that's a goat thing. And that's okay. In terms of the sheer force, the lamb average is about 4.2 kilos. So 
we've got, I think that there in that box, if you take anything away today, can be that I think quite quickly, if we want to go down this road of really marketing a high quality product, that step one is to, is to solve this problem. And we know we can do it because we've done it in the lamb industry and it's possible. And there's papers out there that the South Africans have looked into this years ago and found that there was, um, there was the possibility to do that. Um, this was the most highly marbled goat, Carcass 5. Um, that's it against one of its compatriots. So you can see there, I mean, that's a sort of um, intramuscular fatal marbling that we're getting out of some goats. So in terms of genetic variation, the genetics are there. So I think that's actually really an exciting part about what we found was that there's a large range of variation in their genetics for things like shear force, intramuscular fat and, and, and fat scores. So if we wanna make changes genetically, there's definitely the gene, gene base there to do that. On to the outcome. So of the cuts that we grilled, the rump was the most tender. And it was basically, interestingly, and we've seen this in lamb as well, is that the knuckle or the round um, is, eats very similarly to, to the rumps and loins. The loin here generally performed the worst. And look, I think what that is was that uh, the fat cover across the loin, uh, not overly high or not overly deep. And so I think potentially this one here is being driven by cold shortening, that tenderness at the top right there loin. But overall, they're eating quite well. So those scores up on the left-hand side, they're the consumer scores out of 100 for tenderness is T, juiciness is J, flavor and overall liking. So you can see there that overall, they didn't, they didn't mind that at all. And if we were to put the lens of, um, let's say beef or sheep meat, your cutoff for a three-star product is 46 out of 100. So you can see that pretty much everything there is meeting it. If we look at the overall liking, um, which is, I think, quite promising. The slow cooks, the forequarter shin and the hindquarter shin perform the best across the board. So for tenderness, juiciness, flavor, overall liking, and the leg performed the worst. The leg was quite dry. Um, so, you know, what that means, I'm not entirely sure, but essentially um, they ate quite well. What we did have though, was a really, like it was really skewed for those, that um, shank meat, because it just came out beautifully. It was buttery, it was soft, it was delicious. The roasts were interesting. So we had, well, you can see it there. It was, it was fairly even across the board with how they ate and they all ate in that sort of oh, 50s, mid to high 50s for overall liking. So generally people didn't mind the roast. Um, it, yep, it was a bit dry. Um, you can see the juiciness scores there for different cuts are bouncing around a bit. But what I think too is that knuckle, let's say for juiciness in the top right there, the knuckles, quite a small cut and we cook it separately to the rest of the leg. And so that might've had an impact on how it cooked and how quickly it dried out. It didn't take long to cook, um, probably only 25 minutes in a 160 degree fan forced oven, but still that might've been enough time to pull, pull some juice out of that um, and render out whatever fat might've been in there. So I guess realistically, tenderness has got, and I had, I think I had another slide in here and I took it out in a rush, um, but tenderness had a similar trend in lamb. And so what we found is, is that obviously as shear force is increasing, eating quality is decreasing. But the other slide that I took out stupidly was around yield. And so if you look at yield and eating quality, what you what you end up doing is reduce, if you chase yield, you'll reduce eating quality. And I know for a fact that we're really starting, or when I say starting, it's been for the past 12 months, I suppose, but these big solid muscular billy goats that are coming into our um, herds at the moment could potentially have a massive impact on our eating quality. The lamb industry found that out the hard way, the pig industry has definitely found that out. So by chasing yield, we reduce eating quality. But then as I think Paul said earlier, you know, we start to impact on different, different things like fertility, the ability to get, um, let's say in the pig industry, the ability to get in pig again. So there's all these sorts of, um, by focusing on that one trait, we're gonna have an impact on, on the, um, a number of different outcomes and eating quality will be one of them. So that'd be something that I'd say that we really need to focus on and make sure we don't, don't um, go too hard. 
But look, from this, it was a small study. There was only three consumer groups. It, it wasn't by any means comprehensive, but I think what we do know is that goat meat's got the potential to be a high value source of red meat. Okay, we, if we look at our, we've actually got willingness to pay data and I probably should have flicked that up as well, but for something that they considered to be good everyday product, they were willing to pay about 18 bucks a kilo. Better than every day, it was about 25 and a premium quality product or what they perceived to be premium, they were willing to pay about 32 bucks. If you want that report, probably um, send Mel an email and she can provide you with that. I think she's got a copy and if she doesn't, I can send her one. But um, they're willing to pay. And so if they're willing to pay $18 a kilo for just good everyday product off the shelf, then I think that's, that's a bright future for goat meat. We do know that those low hanging fruit are the processing factors. So things that we can do on plant, if we're chasing a high value market, doesn't need to be across everything. We've obviously got a really good market in our export markets for our goat meat. But if we're gonna chase that high quality market and we're gonna try and maintain consistency and reduce variability in our product, then some of those processing factors, if we can nail those down, then we really just need to focus on what we're doing at home. And the last thing I'd say is learn from the lamb industry and the pig industry for that matter. We've got to maintain focus on yield, yes, but yield and quality. And it was a really interesting thought there before around not getting a goat that's too big. So we really need to work out what our consumer wants before we make these breeding decisions because those genetic decisions can really have an impact as we move forward into the future. And on that, I'll say thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jared. That was a really great way to wrap up our um, presenters today and an insight into potentially some of the future of goat meat quality on our, on our domestic shelves. Um, the slide that we have up right now is, is just a, a quick Q&A um, slide, but it's also promoting the new goat hub that we have on our MLA website. So if you want anything to do with goats, whether that's research, market insights, view the recordings from the Goat Roadshow webinar, um, or sign up to our quarterly Goats on the Move newsletter, please jump onto the Goats Hub uh, for more information on all things goats. And just a, a quick reminder to all of our attendees tonight, if you do have any questions stemming from the presentations that you've just heard, if you can pop them down in the Q&A session um, and we'll answer those now. So I might just ask if all of the, um, Speakers tonight can just pop off mute um, and we'll jump into our live Q&A. The first question that we, we might jump on to um, was one from Pete McGillchrist. Pete asked, is the domestic market mainly taking eight to 12 kilo carcasses because there's insufficient segregation of carcasses on sex and breed? And do you think that market would choose a different product if segregation of males from females was more common? And I'd like to palm this one off to you, John, to start. Uh, thanks, Mel. Yeah, from what I've seen, the domestic market wants the smaller goats um, and even smaller than eight to 12 kilos. So there's some people in the domestic market that want a six kilo um, goat, you know, baby goats they want very small goats. So that eight to 12 isn't a good uh, weight for processes because you, you've got a, still got the same killing cost, but you've got very little meat for, for what you're getting it. And in the Australian domestic market, it gets sold as a premium and that's what consumers want. And, and the question about, uh, you know, segregation of males to females and that sort of thing um, is, is not relevant because some people will prefer a, a billy and and specifically ask for a billy and you know there might be some leniency in in the over 16 weight range with nannies but generally you, people don't want a nanny that's 18 or 19 kilos from what i've seen in my experience with the domestic market so it's it's just that size small goat that the domestic market from what I've seen um, is after in, in a relatively large supply, you know, um, I'm not sure what the Australian domestic market would be, but it'd be in the realms of sort of three or 4,000 goats a week um, in the capital cities. 
and and that's sort of what they're after but it's it's expensive to process and it's um yeah and, and those style goats don't yield very well either so you know the smaller the goat the, the less yield the producer will get great thanks john um michael would you have anything to add from your perspective and potentially some of your customers if they're demanding that smaller breed or or even demanding some segregation on on sex and breed as well uh, my customers can you hear me then yes yeah yeah my customers always want a, a wedded goat so that's why i'm basically uh, always sourcing farm the goats that have to be from a managed farm yeah always weathers and but basically uh they will take any size weather like i mean the biggest weather i've ever uh, slaughtered was a 56 kilos dressed and uh, someone bought it i didn't think anyone would ever buy it and it just come with a mob of goats so yeah for me it's like yeah i prefer goats over 15 kilos but mainly in the 20 to 25 kilo is ideal but up to 30 is still all right i can market them okay but once i get over 30 it's a bit more limited i've got a uh uh, I can sell them but at a, at a cheaper price. But also those bigger animals, they're still bringing a good return for, for, for the for the producer if they're dressing, you know, 40 and 50 kilos. It's still good money for the producer. So, um, and I've got less uh, kill cost per kilo, so I can discount the price a bit and move them. Yeah, great. Thanks for that insight. I guess it's a, it's a really good um, demonstration of how different markets can also play into different um what you're what as a producer what you're trying to to market and how you're going to fit it into that said market that you're going to for what the consumer's requiring and demanding and and how that differs so it's so important to know the market that you're trying to hit your on-farm specifications for the next question that we might um pop into is was one that came up early in the, the webinar and it was a quick question to say, how many goats do you turn off each year? So I thought I might jump to you first, Michael, um, and then I'll hand over to you, John. Okay, if you're, like, for me, I'm processing probably up to about 1,500 carcasses a year. Uh, I could do more, but I'm constrained by supply of the right type of animal and just uh, as my own time to uh, share between running properties and uh, a few other things I do. Uh, just, I, I, I can't really devote any more time to, to the goat business as it is, but if there was a good supply and I could easily access more, I could do more each week. So that's right. on, I, I don't know whether the person was asking about how many I'm processing or whether they're asking about how many I've breed out of my own herd. But, yeah. um, I think at the moment, how many do you turn off? But I mean, how many do you breed as well, Michael? And then we'll jump to you, John. Uh, breeding, yeah, it's I've got about 200, 200 uh, breeding does. So probably about, it's going to be about 170%. Uh, weaning rate. So and that, what type of weights are they normally when they're exiting your farm? When they're exiting, well, that depends whether they're going for live or going for slaughter. If they're going live uh, on an overseas export, I mean, they're normally heading off at about 25 kilos live weight, 25 to 35 kilo live weight size. Apart from that, a slaughter weight, well, I like to take them up to up to about uh, you know 40 to 50 kilos live. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, and John, I guess the same questions go for you. Uh, the first one is how many goats do you turn off each year and and um, how many of those would be your own and how many of those are in the depot? And then um, roughly what weights and condition would they be in? Well, that all depends on season, but it, you're probably looking at sort of between 50 and 100,000 a year. Um, and that's, you know, generally the the in a mixed mob of goats, there'll be a third billies, a third nannies, and a third uh, weaners. So uh, if we're buying the weaners and then paddock them, if, if you know if we've got feed and we're uh, growing them out, then uh, they'll end up going to slaughter as well. Um, but over the you know part of the problem that we have with goat oversupply at the moment is uh, people like me uh, uh, sending uh, restocker goats to Queensland and. Uh, 
and creating a, a large breeding population, um, which is good for developing the industry, but it's just coincided with um, uh, some, some unfortunate market conditions um, in the export market. Um, but you know, it's sort of what the, the industry needed to uh, progress to uh, for, for uh, continued uh, um, you know, uh, supply that was um, you know, reliable. Um, yeah, no, definitely. We're um, we're definitely going, still going through that rebuilding phase where we did see a lot of goats um, and kill numbers were really high during the drought because goats were, you know, on the backbone of, of everyone during the drought and helped a lot of people through the drought. Um, and so we are seeing that people now that we've had a really good season are definitely trying to retain those those breeding stock to help build up um, national numbers, but it has like you said, coincided with a bit of a, a drop in the, the price. Um, jumping, jumping over to you, Paul, um, I guess from a processor's perspective, it'd be really interesting for our um, attendees to understand how many goats to TFI process a year. Yeah, look, that, that, that also it varies with, the, uh, with seasonality and of course where the market is at the moment. If we take the last two months away, we were, fairly well consistently down here in South Australia at Lobethal doing between say six to 10,000 goats most weeks. Um, and it was always the idea that, and of course a lot of those goats would be drawn not only from just in South Australia, but from Western New South Wales and, and further on. So it was always their idea that once we've been in Stilius, once we get Burke um, properly going, that a lot of those goats would go back towards Burke. We'll still fill some goats at Lobethal, but um, yeah, around six to, you know, I think the best week more than 12,000 and you know, the worst week you've ordered on two or 3,000. You know, obviously in the bowels of winter, sometimes you might get back to two or 3,000 and of course the peak period's always the late spring, summer till about April. And um, John would know better than myself, but, you know, we see we tend to see the, 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 uh, see the goats kid in May, June in that winter period and, and hibernate a bit and... Um, spread out and different things when they when they get the rain and then come out again in the, the late spring and summer. So they are a little bit seasonal, but as we discussed earlier with the exclusion fencing and those type of things now, that'll probably alleviate a little bit of that peak and trough of the supply, I'd hope, Melanie, going forward. Yeah, great. Thanks, Paul. Um, and just touching on that, you, you mentioned the BERT. We've had a couple of questions come through about the BERT facilities. Um, and I think you touched on it a little bit in your presentation, but if you wouldn't mind elaborating, um, when do you expect the BERT plant will reach its full capacity if you've forecasted that out um, and have that crystal ball? Um, and what is the production in the next few months for the, for the BERT facility? Yeah, so I think it'll take at least 12 more months for it to reach peak production. Um, which, you know, from our perspective, might be around 3,000 goats. We may do some light sheep there on top of that, so we might do up to 4,000 units a day, given we can get the labour. Um, but certainly uh, in the short term, I don't see us winding it up past where it is now uh, until, as I said earlier, until probably mid-late February. And until we get that US listing, it's pointless uh, processing any more goats because you really cannot sell them domestically. Um, and there really, there are... We do have some market access to some other countries which you can push a container out here and there, but really to, to do the numbers, um, we need the, uh, the US and we're also working on our skin on operation there. It's a, it's a great, great setup, but it needs some fine tuning as well. Um, so that's also gonna take a few months uh, to fine tune that. So, um, and that'll obviously give us access to that Asian market for the skin on goats. But um, yeah, look, it's going to be at least mid late February, Melanie, before we even, excuse me, look like, you know, winding up to 1,000 or 1,500 a day. And we'll build very, very quickly from there. We're continuing to bring in the uh, the overseas workers now. I think we have another dozen turn up this week and we're skilling those people up as we go. So, look, you know, we're fortunate. And I say this in the right manner that uh, we always were of the opinion that we'll do it right, we'll do it right, right from the beginning. Um, I know a lot of producers are you know, looking to, to move goats the way that, that, that things have gone, but we'll do it slowly and we'll do it right and we'll build it correctly. And we're in the position with obviously our other facilities, with our other land 
beef and uh, lamb and mutton plants that uh, whilst there's a significant cost involved in this uh, slow go stage or commissioning um, stage that uh, the business is prepared to wear those costs to look over the next five or 10 years. So um, of course we'd like to be going a bit quicker, but it's not the end of the world for us. We've got other incomes that can support the, the cost of uh, going slow till, we, till, till we're able to tick all the boxes and then, then we'll ramp it right up. Yeah, great. Um, I guess just following on to that, there's been a couple of questions that have come through in terms of, um, I guess, TFI, how much of your production is export versus domestic? And is there the potential for people to do service kills at facilities such as Burke? Um, so it's all processed as export at, well, it will be uh, once we get the US listing. Um, but that doesn't preclude you from selling any of it domestically if you'd like to. Um, we will look, we have a, a fairly large domestic arm and I didn't touch on that in the business called Thomas Foods International. And um, so we have those facilities in Melbourne, Sydney, Coffs Harbour, Darwin, Adelaide, um, fairly large um, domestic outlets that handle all the proteins. Uh, and so we'll endeavour to uh, try and do more go into some of those domestic channels. But as has been spoken, it is in the big picture a fairly small market, but we do some now, we did the whole way through, but we'll try and grow that. Um, from a service kill perspective, no, look, we're, we're a business that uh, we do service kill for one of the major supermarkets in Australia, one of our facilities. Um, but at this stage, that's really, um, Thomas has always been of the opinion that they'd, uh, that they'd do their own, you know, create their own destiny and, um, and, uh, and the value chain and the investments that they've made overseas over the last decade have enabled them to be in that position to not have to rely on service killing and, um, and to sort of be further integrated in the business. Yeah, great. Sales. Thanks, Paul. Um, and I guess this is one also on the, on the processing side of things, but John, you might have a, an interesting take on it as well. Um, is the increase in supply of goats impacting the dollar value or the price over the hook? Definitely. Yes, definitely. So the, the reason that the price went so high, like higher than prime lamb, was because of uh, very low supply, historically low supply, and certain customers only wanting goat. Then the rest of the people that used to eat goat um, would take it or leave it depending on the price. It was interchangeable with mutton. Some might prefer goat to mutton, but it was hovering around the mutton price. Now, um, supply has impacted that, as Paul said before, but there's also other confounding problems as in drought and oversupply of grinding beef and, uh, and, a, and a depressed US market and uh, China, China, lockdowns and, and all those things making a bit of a perfect storm to make this this over over correction happen but just for people to keep in mind that um as paul said before the majority of all goat meat is exported and the majority of that is all cubed bone in into one inch cubes and that's how people traditionally want to eat it and that's how they've always eaten it that's how the market developed selling to those people that want to eat one inch cubed bone in skin on or skin off if it's skin on they still cube it in cubes and slow cook it and that's how um you know australia you know has previously killed two and a half thousand goats in a year i mean like two years ago we killed a million goats last financial year 1.5 this financial year if we've got enough processes like if bird gets going we'll kill two 2.3 million goats so the Supply has doubled essentially in a couple of years, but Australia's killed that number of goats before, but not at this price point and not with their other market conditions. But all that goat that was getting killed before was, you know, around the 14 kilo average and it was all diced in cubes. And that's how people traditionally ate it and traditionally wanted it. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point that you make, John. And I, something that we probably haven't touched on this webinar is that on a global scale, Australia is a, a relatively small producer of, in terms of volume of goat meat, but we are the largest exporter in terms of, of value of goat meat. So we compete in that top end goat meat price point. 
but also one of the largest in terms of volume that we export to countries. So we're very well known for the for producing quality red meat, um, and goat meat is definitely one of those um, commodities that we export for the for not only the quality but the highly nutritious um, side of, of goat meat as a protein source as well. And that probably leads in quite nicely to um, to the next question, Jared, which is for you um, from Colin Ramsey asking. Can you please talk a little bit about the genetics that will help to improve eating quality? Sadly, I probably can't. Um, I didn't delve too deep into the dark arts of genetics, but um, I do know that um, uh, kid plan, so MLA definitely has kid plan, which is like land plan. Um, and it, it sort of takes those genetic factors um, and gives you breeding values. On those, so for anyone doing stud breeding, um, you know, supporting that type of system can only improve the improve the um, uh, the genetic genetic base of our goat population. But um, in terms of what impacts eating quality, um, focusing on things like intramuscular fat will just increase juiciness. It doesn't have to be a wagyu; it just needs to have some fat to increase increase that but in saying that again it comes back to the consumer um, chasing things like yield as I said before um, whatever genes are driving that um, can also impact tenderness negatively um, so yeah I couldn't I couldn't answer that specifically what I would say is probably shoot across the kid plan or reach out I think Sam Walkham at UNE's done uh, done a bit of background work on goat genetics as well so he might be a, a good name to look up and, and chase the information as well. Other than Perfect. Smell. I mean, yeah. ge genetics are, are a really interesting one with how people are looking at shaping eating quality in different species. I don't think there's been a whole lot done in the goat game, um, but it would be really interesting, I guess, Jared, to kind of, I guess, build on that question and what would your three take-home messages to how producers can look at influencing their on-farm activities to have a flow on to a positive potentially eating quality experience in goat meat? Um, look, I think it was touched on exceptionally well by John um, around reducing time in the yards, reducing stress, things like that. So you probably all heard the term dark cutting, but um, that's essentially driven by stress and goats, we know stress quite easily. So reducing that would be number one. So um, reducing the amount of time you've got them held for um, between then and slaughter. Um, the other one would be managing feed base, if that's something you're doing. So if you're managing that goat population and you're trying to get a quality article out there, uh, managing feed base moving forward. And I guess, um, yeah, lastly would be make some, if you are breeding those goats, make some informed decisions around the genetics you're chasing. Don't just don't just go to the sale and buy the biggest, ugliest buck you can find because he's he's um, going to produce the most meat. I know that's what the grid pays on now is, is weight, but um, realistically, if we want to try and diversify the market away from maybe relying on domestic export uh, export markets or, or domestic um, or, or curry houses or whatever else is chasing that sort of eight to 15 kilo article. If we want trying to differentiate and create, capture a wider market, we need to make sure we're making those decisions now, um, as opposed to making, trying to make those snap decisions later after the, the horse is bolted. Great. Thanks very much, Jared. That's some really useful practical information for producers. Welcome. Just before we, we wrap up tonight's webinar, um, there's a couple of, of final questions. One is um, just about the variation between farm goats and, and rangeland goats as a reflection on nutrition and farming practices. Um, John, did you want to touch on that um, a little bit about the difference? And then, and Michael, we might go to you as well. The difference between um, rangeland goats and, and uh farm goats in terms of um, nutrition and, and different practices and inputs conducted on farm? Well, I'm no expert on it, but um, generally rangeland goats pre prefer to have 80% um, upper story foliage and 20% grass. For, and, and our place doesn't have much upper story foliage, but they do well on, on herbage and 
and chenopods and um, and bush and, and grass as well, but they, they do like to have that roughage. Um, in terms of uh, rangeland goats and, and, and farm goats, you know, rangeland goats in a, in a, in a dry season don't put, do any weight gain. You can have a 20 kilo live weight doe that's, um, you know, so not quite big enough to go to the export abattoir and be six tooth. Um, but in a really good season like now, uh, 18 to 20 kilo winner will be putting on, um, you know, 1.2 to 1.5 kilograms a day. And I, I'd say a, a bull or a Kalahari cross would probably be doing more than that, but they're also eating more at the same time. So um, it doesn't really matter what, what gut you have, the more, the faster they put on weight, the more they're eating and the more they're impacting it on your, uh, on your pastures, so uh, that's about all I can relate yeah. on that. Thanks, Don. Um, Michael, did you want to touch on some differences that you've seen between, I guess, rangeland input systems and farm goat input systems and how that relates to, I guess, price points as well? Yeah, well, um, I've tried um, range, like proper rangeland goat, but the, the, the taste is unacceptable to, to my customers. It's just, I mean, it must be just a, an impartial, in, imparting of flavors from the from the herbage or the bushes they're eating and such and uh, but i mean the main problem is also that uh, is that you don't often get rangeland weathers so that sort of rules it out most of the time and the other thing is i do get some rangeland weathers coming through that have been bred on farm from rangeland nannies and their meat quality is fine so it's just a matter of i think it's the it's the diet they're on so as compared to eating bushes they're eating probably some uh, grain supplement hay and grass and and then and the flavor is okay and the texture and the fat quality and stuff yeah but um so there's a difference between range there and then you've got well your boar goats to me is the for my job is probably you know the the uh, higher content of boar goat is a better product for what I'm doing, but so long as it's not overfat, a bull goat won't get overfat unless it's overfed. And I mean, I think it's the same for any animal. They won't get overfat unless they're overfed. I mean, some animals are prone to get a bit more fat. I find the probably the rangelands actually, when they've got heaps of feed, they tend to get an uneven fat cover compared to a bull goat. A bull goat will be have a much uh, smoother fat cover compared to a rangeland or um, an angora is another one that gets very sort of lumpy fat and uh, oily fat, but you don't, you don't ever come across many angora um, meat animals. There's only a few, very few around. But like a, if you held a, a piece of angora carcass in your hand, and if it's fat, the fat will start to run off your hand. Like it, it'll just, it's like holding butter in your hand. It's quite strange. That's what I found with angora meat. So there, there is differences in, in the character of the, of the meat and fat within different breeds. Mm. Wonderful. And I guess that, you know, in some ways that also translates to the, the cost of management and production for different types of enterprises and, and in different regions with, with farmed animals tending, tending to have a higher input cost of production versus your, your rangelands. But that does vary, obviously, between season and scale of operation. I guess as a, a way of looking at the time and, and just wrapping up today, I think it would be really great if we could bring this back to how producers can you know, make the most of, of meeting the market. Um, and if you can each have just one key take home, if you could impart some of your wisdom um, to our audience today of, of what they can do on farm to, to really try to meet the market. I know Paul's alluded to it already, the no one still Paul's um, advice, but John, did you want to start? Oh, you're just on mute, sorry. Yeah, I think the, the future of, of managed is, is probably sticking with rangeland goats and, and just managing them better and, and keeping them in that, um, you know, 10 to 20 kilogram weight range. And, and you've already got a great product that, um, that uh, our current consumers, you know, love the taste of. Yeah, there's a lot to be said about the the hardy rangeland goat that's so fit for environment and fit for purpose um, and fit for that export market that it reaches. So great 
great advice there, John. Michael, did you have some some parting wisdom? Parting wisdom? Oh, I just think in all things, I think don't overcomplicate your business with your goats. Try to find a niche that you can fit into. I mean, if you want to um, make more money out of your business, you have to put more effort into it. That's a great take home. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Paul, you're next. What's your, your parting words of wisdom? I really was. I said, just stay positive. Don't panic about the short-term disruptions in the market. Um, play the long game. And, you know, I'm sure if we're talking again in 12 or 18 months, we'll be having, a, I think, a different conversation we are today. And weigh your goats. And weigh your goats, absolutely. And, Jared, what's your parting words of wisdom? Uh, well, definitely weigh your goats. Collect as much information as you can. But um, I think what mine would be is... Um, know what your target market is and know what they want and, and chase that. So, I mean, I've talked a lot about eating quality, but, you know, realistically, that's, a, um, that's only one part of what we do. So, yeah, know, know what the market is and, and hunt that down for sure. Wonderful. What a, what, a, what a great way to wrap up. So thank you for all of your words of wisdom um, and thank you to everyone for jumping on tonight. Please do find in the chat function um, the survey link. We would love to know what you thought about tonight's um, survey so we can keep running these wonderful goat roadshows run through our communicators. Um, awesome job to all of our speakers. Thank you so much for giving up your time um, to present and give an insight into the goat meat supply chain. And thank you for all of our attendees for listening. Have a great night and I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>